plenty to talk about in this session. So we're gonna get started. Um, happy Tuesday, uh, whether that's morning or afternoon where this finds you. Um, our session today is gonna be focused in on landlord engagement uh, and we got a brunch, bunch of brilliant people here um, and we'll, we'll do a round of introductions here in a second and kick us off. Um, one thing to say, just as we get started, uh, this is not gonna be the one solution to landlord engagement. Uh, this is gonna be some conversations with people that have done a brilliant job uh, and wanna share some of the things that they've learned. Um, and then we're gonna roll in and there's gonna be a lot of questions. We'll try to get to them. We're not gonna get to all of them. We'll just elevate that right now. Um, but we are going to be recording this session. Uh, we're more than likely gonna max out on participants. So we wanna make sure this recording is available to others uh, as we move forward. Uh, but before we dive into topics, let's hear who all's on our panel. So we're going to do name, pronouns, um, where you find yourself, what location are you in right now, and uh, what is one thing that has bringing you hope right now in the landlord engagement space. So all the panelists, if you could go ahead and raise your hands, um, and then we'll pass the mic around. And as uh, the mic gets to you, you just go ahead and lower your hand, and then we can pass it on from there. Uh, but I'll start. I'm Derek Wentorf, I use he him pronouns. Uh, I am in Seattle, Washington and work for CSH and am providing you know, technical assistance and just support for this conversation. Uh, and I'm lucky enough to be here. Um, so I'll go ahead and pass it off to Lola first. Lola, do you wanna get us going? I know I put you right on the spot. I did it right from the beginning. I was the last one to raise my hand. <laughs> That's the I called Hi, out. Hi, right? I'm Lola. Welcome. I am in Baltimore, Maryland. I am chair of Baltimore, Maryland's Youth Action Board, as well as um, on a board of representatives for Youth Empowered Society. It's a bunch of things I do here. I'm on the COC board. I'm chair for the YHAC on the COC board. Um, and I've stayed in every type of housing in Baltimore City. So I am currently housed and I have a voucher. So that's my expertise. Thanks, Lola. And what's one thing that brings you hope or excitement right now as you think about landlord engagement? Is there anything you want to highlight? Um, the fact that we are having conversations to actually make improvement and everyone is able to give their feedback and give ideas on how they think things can be improved. That's one of the first steps in having improvement. Because if no one says anything, nothing's going to change. And that's why I do what I do. I, I'm always open to giving feedback on anything, restaurants, programs, anything, anything <laughs> I go to. The way for improvement is to give feedback. Great. Thanks, Lola. And you pass the mic off to one of our panelists. Any, many, money, mo. Uh, is this Sila de la Cruz? Sla How you say? Sly. Like the slide, like Sylvester Stallone kind of thing, or the family stuff. Like Thank you. Thank you so much, Lola. Um, so great to meet everybody. My name is Sly De La Cruz. I use she, her pronouns. I am based in New York City. It's very cold here right now. Um, and I work for Point Source Youth. We provide technical assistance and consultations to um, different communities around the 50 states and within the interventions of host homes, um, direct cash transfers, family kinship intervention, and of course, rapid rehousing. Um, and I think the question was, what am I hopeful for within the landlord engagement space? And I think um, I'm excited for the work that is being done when it comes to building youth anatomy into the um, landlord engagement portion of searching for housing. Um, but I am hopeful that it will continue to grow and that uh, youth will be able to, you know, go out there and search for their own apartment with their own anatomy and landlords will be able to trust them and kind of treat them like any other adult that is coming to rent a, a unit. Um, and I'll pass it to Kim. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Sly. Um, my name is Kim Painter. I use she, her pronouns. I'm in Arlington, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C., where I work for a, um, an affordable housing nonprofit developer and owner. So, And I think I'm hopeful that through the course of the pandemic, more and more landlords have had to interface with the safety net. And I think kind of the start of more of those relationships formed is a real opportunity. So, I'll pass on to Lynn.
Oh, Lynn, you're muted still. Can't hear you. See, there goes the two technologies working, right? <laughs> I'm Lynn Phillips. I'm with Southern Management Companies. Uh, we have, uh, we're a privately owned landlord in Virginia, Northern Virginia, and Maryland. We have property from Washington, D.C. up to Baltimore. And um, I am most excited about landlords being invited to the conversation uh, up front. Uh, we do that quite a bit in our area, so that helps a lot. And I will pass it off to Emily. Thanks, Lynn. Um, I'm Emily Carmody. I use she, her pronouns. I'm in Durham, North Carolina, and I work for Redesign Collaborative. Uh, we're a small technical assistance firm that helps systems across the country with various things, including landlord engagement. Um, what gives me hope is the 1,000 people who are on this call, the 1,600 people who registered, and our colleagues in this field, I've, I've worked in homelessness for over two decades now, and we are a rough and tumble, dogged group that never met a barrier. We didn't climb, run around, dig, dig under, whatever it was. Um, so that's what always gives me hope. But especially in this space, it's the creativity. I, I never walk away from a landlord engagement discussion without learning at least one new technique to take and share with other people. And I love, um, it's kind of a new frontier. So there's lots of possibility and a lot of creativity in this space that I enjoy. I'm gonna pass it to Kathy. Hi, um, my name is Kathy Zoll. I am use uh, she and her. Uh, I'm calling from uh, New London, Connecticut. And we are primarily an emergency shelter provider, um, but also do rapid rehousing. And I would say what I'm most encouraged about is uh, that I've been watching rapid rehousing for a long time. And I think we're close to being at a place where it's not just for a very few. Um, I think the pandemic has shown us that housing is the answer to homelessness. And so I'm really, really hopeful that somehow we will carry that energy of housing being the answer to homelessness into the post pandemic period, because I think we've shown that we can help everyone find housing if we just are creative enough about it. So I'm just hopeful that somehow that energy will continue um, after the, the pandemic. So I'll pass it on to Dan. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, my name is Dan Hodgkins. Um, use he, him, his pronouns. I'm a senior director at Preble Street. Uh, we're an agency located up in Maine. Um, I oversee our SSVF grant um, program, so we work with veterans throughout the state. Uh, and one thing that <clears throat> brings me some hope is that the vast majority of landlords that rent to one of our clients are willing to rent to another client. Um, so once they kind of start renting um, to people we work with, um, more often than not, they're willing to, to keep working with our program. So that gives me some hope. And I will pass it to Chris. Thank you. So my name is Chris Freed, and I am the chief program officer for an organization uh, in Los Angeles, LA Family Housing. We're, we're both uh, a service provider and a real estate developer. Um, and uh, what I am most excited about really is having the discussion around how master leasing will help us both expand on shared housing techniques and actually create throughput to our system. Because I think what we are starting to notice around the country is we do not have enough single and one bedroom apartments to house all the people that we're trying to get housed. And we have to be creative with our uh, solutions in order to ensure that we're actually making a difference and continuing the good momentum um, that we have been on in years past, particularly around our relationship building with landlords. And, uh, I don't know. Is that everyone? Dejane. Oh, wow. Dejane. Sorry. Sorry. Not least. You're okay. fine. Um, what were the um I know how to do name, pronoun, organization. Yeah, where you're um, at. And then just one thing that brings you hope, Dejane. All right. My name is Dejane Day. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a part of the Prince George's County Youth Action Board. And I think one thing that gives me hope is how the community kind of comes together and how 
there are there are good people in the world. There is this stigma out here where people I'm like some people are selfish, but there's a stigma that okay, everybody wants for their self, nobody gives back, nobody wants to help out, but within this work, I've just seen a lot of good people. So that gives me hope for a better future for my generation and my children's generation. Thank you, Dejane. Thank you, everyone. Um, so let's let's kick off a conversation and hear directly from Kim and Lynn on the property management and landlord side of like, what are some strategies that have really worked for engaging landlords from your lens, from your colleagues, from your partners, from working directly with you? Uh, what are some things you would really like to say that you've, uh, it, that, that you want to elevate as practices that um, have really made a difference in that partnership? Uh, so Kim, Lynn, I'll pass it to you, jump in. I'm happy to kick off, Lynn, and already my mind is going in a million directions just from everyone's hopeful comments. Um, the first thing that's already come up to me, for me, is really just the importance of relationships, and I think everybody on this call has experienced this and knows this, and so um, uh, I think what we've found in kind of being in this space for the past 15, 20 years is that nothing really supersedes that, right? You can have all the incentives in the world. Um, you can have, you know, dollars, you can have people, um, but if those people aren't in relationship together, kind of working towards a common goal, um, it's not going to, the pieces are going to come apart. So just to kind of say that up front, I think for us, a really basic way that we do that with our rapid rehousing partners and our property management company is to bring everybody together. So to make sure that we're intentional to fit in those quarterly meetings, to fit in the monthly meetings, to make sure the property manager knows who to, which housing case manager to call. Some of those are really basic, but I think that's the foundational stuff that's just really important. And as Dan said, right, if, if landlords will rent to one client, then they'll rent to another. And I think that's really true. Um, I do want to share, and then I am so excited to hear what Lynn has to say too, you know, just um, some of the practical things that we as an owner have kind of consistently over the years asked of our partners. So as you're thinking about putting together an MOU or thinking about how to kind of hook, hook a landlord, how, what might be important to them, I think for us, um, we always ask for um, a, a phone number that we can call 24 seven that will put us in touch with the case management team. So that right off the bat, I will say we rarely use it, um, but I think that's a really important um, just reassurance for the landlord team, especially if they're going into a new partnership and the relationships are new, so that they'll have somebody to call to kind of talk through. Um, the other really um, important thing that comes up right is, is fair housing. And we as a landlord, we kind of waive or are more lenient on our credit, our criminal background, our minimum income requirements. And so um, sometimes I think over the years, as we've figured out how to um, structure that, you know, to have a fair housing attorney who can walk us through um, those key points and answer key questions. Um, and then uh, something that Arlington has put together that I'll just plug here. Um, I know there's one in Seattle too that we modeled ours off of, but through the COC, we were able to put together an Arlington Landlord Partnership. Um, and so there are multiple um, service providers who are um, kind of members on the service side and landlords and that partnership fundraise to fundraise a risk reduction fund, stay at the early stages, get all the landlords together to say, where do we want to be? Where are we comfortable on kind of criminal background to kind of get on the same page there? And um, that's been really helpful to get landlords to the table because you have landlords who can speak to the program, they can help with recruitment um, and the risk reduction fund. For ours, it's structured with um, landlords can claim up to $3,000 for any lost income, lost rent damages that might, might come up. So just a few tools to, to get the conversation started. And, and some of the things that have worked for us, uh, we've had some really long-term partnerships uh, with some of the organizations. Uh, we've had an organization that's had apartments with us for 20 years uh, in the name of their organization as they move people in and out. Um, and we do find that that type of uh, partnership, even though we have many different ones, that one does seem to work the strongest because um, we are usually brought to the table at the beginning of the conversation. Uh, we've had it where we've had to, uh, the property manager and the team was interviewed 
uh, by the uh, nonprofit organization to make sure it's where they want it to be. Uh, Dejanae uh, had the, we had the pleasure of interviewing for Dejanae and, and her team. And uh, so it gets the buy-in from the property manager uh, right up front. And then it also gives us, as you said, Kim, that point of contact uh, because we want, uh, we want a successful uh, living experience. And a lot of times with that, it comes with the, um, you know, the, the resident that has all the wraparound services with them. Uh, but we definitely, from our uh, Virginia communities to our Maryland, the long-term, uh, the organization putting it in their name has made it a very good, successful partnership for us. Great, thanks, thanks, Lynn and Kim. Uh, I want to open it up to the rest of the panel too, and some of uh, a couple of different prompts also to be thinking about this from the from the engagement side is like, are there some strategies or ways that partners across the community make uh, affordable housing can be an effective business model? Like, how do you elevate that um, to your community to your landlords? Are there different strategies you've used, communication tactics? Um, Kim, Lynn, back to you or to anyone else on the panel, what jumps out to you as you hear that? I'm going to jump in with one more thing, which is just to keep an eye on new developments. This is spoken from someone with a developer, but keep an eye on um, properties that are coming online. It can be much easier to structure kind of as Lynn was saying up front to say we want you know, we're really interested in six units or 10 or 20, right? And to come to the owner, the owner will be focused on lease up, right? There's usually time schedules involved with that. And so kind of more open to, to filling units. And then there's more options for kind of unit se selection in terms of accessibility and some other considerations that folks might need. And the thing that we find um, that works too, landlords worry a lot about apartment lead time, but, uh, lag time of how long it sits available because you know time on that is money and so being able to work one-on-one -on -one directly with uh you know a point of contact saying this is the amount of apartments that we want this is when we'll take them um we don't have that and it takes away some of that concern that you know even with some of our um, local housing authorities getting the inspections done quickly mm -hmm. so we're not having to let the apartment sit for a long a period of time it just takes the argument away from you know from management saying ah you know in the frustration and so i think in, in a lot of our jurisdictions we worked really well uh, with the organization for us to make sure it's ready they give us the list of what they're going to be looking for uh, so we know it's past our inspection it's going to you know and then it should pass their inspection and then we can just house people much quicker that's the landlord's goal i mean that's the beauty we're all working for the same goal is to house people and to house them quickly um, and so that that partnership with our maintenance team uh, the organizations you know just spelling out what you need there's no surprises on either end yeah, I would just say from um, in New London, we're, we're not generally dealing with people with a lot of properties. We're dealing more with independent landlords who maybe have two units, maybe they have four. And there, I just find it very helpful to think that they're trying to run a business. They care and relationships matter. I 100% agree. But we just try to be very thoughtful about what are the friction points? What are the pain points between working with us and having a landlord be successful. And many of them have no property managers, they're owner operators, sometimes they live in the same building. Um, but I think that's a really important market, at least in our area, there's not a lot of subsidized affordable housing that's coming online. So we're really out there in the private marketplace and their um, kind of leasing up quickly matters. Uh, finding and getting the, the right price for your unit and getting paid and having that phone number. I can't say enough how much I, I totally feel that that is critical. And we used to be in a model, we have all these different nice, you know, well-meaning case managers reaching out to landlords by looking online and seeing what's available. That cannot work, in my opinion, in the long term. I think you really need to get ahead of the curve before the thing's on Zillow or wherever it is, and you need to have a, a landlord be able to find somebody. And then I think we can make this a good business proposition, which is what I think is, is needed for a lot of these smaller independent landlords. Kathy, I think you're exactly right. And we're headed into the next 2.0, I think, of landlord engagement is streamlining those relationships. 
rather than every program out for themselves, every case manager of that program out for themselves, really elevating and professionalizing the staff that are doing landlord engagement. This is a skill that we need to highlight and, and hire for. This is not, not every case manager is a good salesperson. Not every salesperson is a good case manager. Let's, let's uh, divide and conquer here. And what we've been seeing a lot is seeing systems work together for landlord engagement so that there's one voice coming from the COC and the homeless service system. We're not outbidding each other. We're not increasing the price per unit. We're working together with a common package and therefore landlords can feel a lot more comfortable with working with our system and not having to learn all of our acronyms and um, insane names that we throw around as if it's uh, regular um, English words. So I, I just think that is the 2.0 is elevating this work and streamlining it as a system. And that can be to the point of having staff at the system level that this is all they're doing on behalf of the entire system or just coordinating your landlord engagement staff across programs so that you're offering the same, you're targeting people and you're um, intervening on behalf of the system, not just your program. So I, I'm, I'm gonna add on that a couple of different things. I think one, um, I think you made Emily a really, really good point. I mean, I think everyone made really good points, but the point around centralizing location is incredibly key because we as a system, the last thing we wanna do is drive up the market within the market that we actually have access to. And if we are all bidding against each other, because there's, you know, if you have a group of nonprofits within any community, then they're all trying to get the same units as they become available, especially as markets start to tighten. I think one of the ways that you start to deal with the business side though, um, to landlords and what speaks to landlords is, especially the mom and pops, is that they're insured that the money is gonna be coming in every single month. That's what they care about. And that you're not disrupting the other people living within the building because everyone has a right to a, a peaceful place to live. And so one of the ways that you that, that I believe that we can start to address this, and I, and I think we're seeing this community by community, as I stated earlier, relative to not having enough one bedrooms and studio apartments, I don't care what community I talk to across the entire country, that it, it, is, it is fact that we are running out of places to put people. And some of our most challenging folks do not meet the qualifications of our, of our landlords. They just don't. And so one of the ways that we can start to mitigate that is by taking con more control of the unit and guaranteeing the landlord's long-term guaranteed one stream paint you know one payment stream that's coming in on those units and that any other unit that they have within their portfolio will also take off their hand so one by one as they come available you know they're taking an entire building we could take unit by unit really focus on the on on the master lease and a third party lease and call it what you want and and community by community can shape it how they want but it really allows us to start doing i, I know this is going to sound awful but essentially a plug and go if you will so that people, you're, you're getting people into housing very, very quickly, especially people that are in encampments or people that are in shelter beds, moving them through the system, creating real throughput and allowing choice, allowing choice relative to who they're gonna live with and what unit they want. Not forcing people into units, but actually allowing people because a lot of the units that we have are the twos, threes and four bedrooms. And when we talk about shared housing, I don't mean five people in a bedroom. I mean, one person, one room or a couple in a room or one small family with a single adult, or, or you know, what we're seeing a lot of in LA right now is a lot of youth being actually paired with seniors, which is a really interesting, they choose each other, which is a really interesting combo, but then having the ability to quickly move them into units. So you get throughput by having these units online, the ones and studios and one bedrooms by quickly being able to put people in and people that otherwise would have been likely not to have been accepted and to, to be able to utilize all the two, threes and four bedrooms in our communities by, by being able to move people in and speaking to the actual business side, to the ownership, because they, they have they have the need to keep these, these buildings funded um, and paid for. Can I just add, oh, I'm so sorry, Lynn, um, but I just wanted to add to Chris' point. Like, I think everybody, like what Kathy brought up, Emily, Chris, and Lynn, and Kim, like, I think engagement varies based on the community that you're targeting, right? And like, where are you going to search for this landlord? Like, I think it, it takes from a provider's standpoint to do your homework, to know how to engage each community in the way that they need to, right? Like, if I know that a landlord is only focus on money and I just want money, 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 which is mostly the case. Like that's going to be my engagement point. 
from the fact of rapid rehousing, like we dedicate ourselves on paying the rent on time. We make sure that we have, you know, our participants back by if they fall behind on rent and they have a contribution that we have them, you know, we have their support. And I think that that particular landlord, knowing that landlord could help you engage it better, right? And getting that communication back, like whether that's an email or a phone, that way you could send material to kind of break those doubts because they may tell you no at first, but then later on, when you start sending like a flyer or, you know, a, a landlord informational that we're hosting and, you know, come check it out and we're offering two months of security, whatever your selling point is, right? That you want to engage, you want to make sure that you have them there, that even if they say no, you have that email to go back like, hey, I know you said no, but this is the changes that we have brought up. This is the support that we're bringing. And I think knowing how to engage a landlord, right? And saying like, okay, I know that you're asking for two, I live in New York City, mind you, but let's say you're asking for 2,100 for a two bedroom, right? I know that a, even a small family won't be able to afford that, right? In the income that we've seen our participants take, but I know that I could put two people in there that will be able to kind of accommodate the rent. And let's talk about adding utilities into the rent since it's already high and we'll give you an extra month of rent in advance. Like selling points are so important and, and knowing your landlord and engagement, I think is very valuable. I think that's such a good point. And I think that's one reason why it's hard sometimes to talk about landlord engagement, because we're going to throw out things that have worked in our different various markets that may not work in your market. You have to get to know your market. You have to do some research here. There's the apartment association has information that you can look at for research. Your city and counties have information about building and development and property owners in your community. Uh, ask your housing authority who they work with and who they don't. These are all, I mean, it's good to know who and who not to be targeting in this. And But there's so much data that we need to really take in to get to know our market and not just um, guess at who we're going to go next just by the listing in the newspaper or I'm dating myself or online um, of, about where that next unit is, right? Like it, we have to start thinking about targeted sales pitches, just like you're saying, knowing our market, knowing our data points, and knowing what the pressure point is on that particular property manager or landlord. And one thing I'll just say is when you hear no, don't stop there. Ask what's behind the no. I hear what you're saying. I understand you're saying no. Can you just tell me a little bit more about why uh, it's a no for you today? Because once you understand the why, you can go back and figure out something to then come back to them with at, at, um, again at the bargaining table or some or maybe they're giving you some real feedback about your system that your system needs to hear. Like inspections take too long. Well, we've really got to streamline that. And it's a great way to get feedback. Yeah, I wanted to add in also with all the comments. I think also the landlords within whether it's the state of Maryland, because I'm in, again, Prince George's or across the nation, I think they have to see kind of by example of how rapid housing is worked within the um, the apartments. I can say with working with Lynn and my colleagues that we have formed, we have formed this relationship and the relationship is still going on where the transitional housing, rapid housing programs we established for our youth is working so far. So I think the landlords probably also along with the technical, you know, information that they need, they need to have some reassurance and they need to see that it's working. And, and to complement um, what Chris said, we do love that it's a, uh, you know, one organization got the apartment, but we also love success stories that you graduated on our community to your own apartment from that, you know, from that thought process because I hear and, and, and Emily you're right I don't speak the language that you guys speak so sometimes when uh, nonprofit organizations they call me and they speak and I'm like hey just break it down who are you serving what are we doing you know and 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 I get an understanding of what they need from us but when a landlord can see a success story that this person you know can live on your community learn the policies and and the uh you know how things work because i hear your industry talk about we graduate them from a program it's nice that they could graduate from and again i'm speaking from the large landlord i i get it but we like to see people graduate at our community and they start to know our service team and you know and then we just build a community around you we're not just a, an apartment we're a whole community uh when you're talking you know more than two or three hundred units so um, that 
success story helps it grow and it makes other management companies know well, what are you guys doing and then they do want to be a part of that because it's a, it's a good thing and it feels good so so i just want to add on that because one thing that that i always tell people particularly around shared housing type conversations because i see a lot of stuff happening kind of in the chat too relative to like nobody wants shared housing or how do you get into shared housing? there's like lots of different right the the mass release starts to help mitigate that because it's a one source pay-in but it also creates opportunities for people who otherwise couldn't get in. So here comes your success. They couldn't get in anywhere else. Nobody else would rent to them. So if you have control, you can get them in. You start to develop a couple of, or the, the tenant themselves, the participant starts to develop a couple of their own things. Like one, they get a rental history of actually being in a unit that they've paid for long-term. Two, they have a decision whether they wanna stay in that particular environment or move. I, I think the thing to remember, and I always say this, is, is the homeless services community, we are not, we have often been deemed the poverty catch-all and expected to fix people's every component. And, and we don't have the ability to do that primarily because we don't control a lot of the factors that actually lead to that. Um, but where we can start to help make it better is, is once people get into the permanent housing is ensuring that you're stabilizing them and that you're really continuing to work with them. Because I think the one thing people always forget about when you're talking rapid rehousing is it's not just getting them into, into units. You got to help them once they're there actually become acclimated to that unit, acclimated to the society or the community, especially if they're moving, help facilitate whatever it takes to, to create the stability. And so that will also create the stability with the landlords. But it, but back to the, to the point of the success story, some people are going to move on. And now they actually have the rental history to be able to move on to a better unit, to a better community, to they might find a different roommate. They might get married. Remember, all of us shared housing at one point of our life. Don't forget that. We were all born. And for those of you that are married or have kids or any of those other things, you are also sharing housing. So there's a way to do it. What we want to try to get away from, though, is the stigma of, of sober livings where it's multiple people. And you just normalize it by making it a roommate situation where it's just, you know, again, a two bedroom and two people. And a lot of people will want to move and some people won't want to move. And we have the ability to accommodate that through creating these master lease agreements or third party, again, call it whatever you want, but really allowing people to get in and be successful and make the decision of what they want to do next in their life. Because it is their life and it's their choice. And the hope is that when they're in the system, and they're working with us that they can they can make those decisions to move. And the other thing I think that's important too is that within that environment, still um, and and really starting to work with HUD on making sure that the policies align relative to allowing people to have vouchers in those master lease scenarios in shared housing, where it can be split and then people can move on. And it makes sense for both HUD side and for for your local PHAs because they're saving money on the front end by, by moving more people in more quickly and actually utilizing uh, all the dollars that they get from, from HUD. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I want to, Lola, so, oh. yeah, I wanted to pass off to you actually. Oh, uh, that was, no, this is perfect. Uh, I would love for you to just like speak on anything that's popping up for you, Lola. And also one of the things that we see a lot of times as we've talked about relationship is a theme I'm hearing consistently, right? There's like, you can think of this as like a three-legged stool a lot of times, right? You've got your property management, landlord side of things, you've got your program operation, and then you have the tenant, right? And I think the question of like, how do we keep the work person-centered in this? Um, how has that worked? Um, and like, I would just love to hear any uh, like advice or knowledge, Lola, from your lens around some of the things that you've been hearing. I want to say it's really four-legged at times because the programs pay for this through grants and federal funding and stuff. And a lot of times that is what the holdup is on like rent being paid on time and paperwork and all these things. So the, it starts there. And then for I'm glad I waited to Chris went because from my experience, like I said, I have a voucher. I've been in transitional house. I don't think I've been in rapid rehousing, but I've been in permanent housing which is how I got my voucher. And now I, this is my first unit. I've been here since like 2016. And I'm trying to move into another unit and I have six years of voucher history, but my credit wasn't good during the pandemic. They wanted a 680 credit score. And I was like, in the middle of the pandemic, you want a 680? But I've been living in the same unit for six years. I've never been evicted. Like, so my lab, we didn't know where to start. But a lot of the issues that I bring back to my lab, and I also talk to Dejanay and PG County, like we meet all the time in Baltimore. It's like, how can we have it 
be a federal mandate that if you're paying rent with a voucher, your credit score doesn't matter. Like, because check the government's credit score. Like they're the one who's gonna be paying the bill consistently. And especially if you don't have a copay. So when you don't have a copay, you're just getting your whole entire rent from the federal government. My credit score is irrelevant. I feel like there's a lot of um, biases depending on which community you're trying to move in and depending on, um, I want to say like amenities you want. Like I'm from New York. I've lived in Georgia for a while. There's just certain things that, and I, everybody, I, anyone on this call, if you've seen some of the apartments, you wouldn't choose to live there yourself. And I feel like we make people who have experienced homelessness it's almost a standard of just be grateful for what you get when that pushes people to have units that are ran by some lords or who aren't as experienced or you'll lean on this wall. I literally, I lived with my cousin before. I leaned on her wall to get up off her couch and my arm went through her wall. Like it was a thin piece of sheetrock and they came and plastered it in the bank. I was like, what the heck is this? I was like, you're paying rent. Like, this is not okay. Like, call your landlord. There's certain things that when you're a renter and not a homeowner that are required of the property management, the landlord, because I rent. I should, there should be um, exterminations yearly or something like that. Like, if I have a rodent problem, I had a rodent problem in this unit. And they, it was such a, a tearful to just get that resolved. Um, a lot of things aren't set up right. My bg &E, my electricity, bg &E is electricity here. I have a, a, a row house and it's split into two apartments, but I was basically the basement, which has the washing machine and dryer and some lights and stuff down there, was hooked up to my line on my gas and electric. I have a one bedroom apartment. My electric and gas bill was 200 plus dollars a month. And I go to work, I'm barely home. So there's a lot of things on the behind that it's like, okay, I want a better, I want a better unit. I want to live in a building with a property manager, a leasing office. And then you'll go and they'll say, well, we only we require a 680 credit score and you have to have um, a month, a security deposit and you have to have, it's like all these things. And as clients or people who've had experience, like, what do I do? I got a voucher. They got to pay the whole rent. If I was in your predicament, I would take me. I get my rent paid all the time. This whole pandemic, my landlord has received rent. The whole pandemic. I'm like, are you dumb? Are we stupid? The math is not mathing. So in certain things you have to, it's the landlords, I think they need to be educated, housing, housing, I've asked them. And of course, I'm in these meetings. I've spoken to our head person at housing and meetings. We got some funds and I was like, what are you doing to improve the quality of units that you're giving these emergency vouchers to? Because it makes no sense to take people who are in shelters and then put them in units where they have to deal with slum wars. So how are we recruiting better landlords? Well, I think it needs to start there. It needs to start federally. Like there should be a requirement, not just basic requirements because they go and they put their paint up. There's outlets that don't work. There's things that, People know how to cut corners just to get by. That also is detrimental and it reintroduces people to Trump. So that's my issue. That's how I'm trying to figure out where do we, who do we talk to? I want to change the big law. So we don't know who to talk to now, but I'm like, do I need to go to the Supreme Court? What do we need to do so that we can change this? We know that vouchers are considered a point of income, but when I go to fill out an application for housing, I mean, for an apartment, what do I put as far as my income goes? Do I just put the maximum amount I can get for a voucher? What do I put for my credit score? What do I, it's very intimidating. Yeah, thanks, uh -huh. Lolo. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, no, I appreciate that. So, Dejanet, did you want to jump in? I want to make sure we also pass off to Dan, too. But Dejanet, yeah, Lolo we'll put some thoughts in my mind as she was talking. <laughs> I wanted to um, say, I'm just like, I'm gonna start off with what she said about the credit scores. So like crazy how, if you're trying to get a house, you can have a 618 credit score, but 
for our apartment, whether you have a voucher or not, you need three times the um, three times income, background checks sometimes, need like 650, 680 to get into the apartment. I'm just like, you're, it's creating this barrier where you're creating more homelessness within the community because you're not really letting people in. If they have a consistent income, why does the credit score matter? If they have like a history of paying a rent on time, why does it matter? And even during a pandemic, I believe it should be a little bit of leniency, but also it's on the local um, and state governments to kind of ensure that it doesn't happen. And I um, seen in one of the chats as everybody was speaking about um, the federal doing kind of a tax thing for the landlords to ensure that um, people with Section 8, people that need rapid rehousing or transitional housing or permanent supportive housing get those services and not in the terrible areas. Mm -hmm. Put them in like middle class or even upper class and kind of have trainers along the way for the youth or adults that come in there to kind of educate themselves so they won't be in that same box. Because I'm like, you could put anybody on Section A bar, are you educating them on their finances? Are you helping them get a job? They're just stuck in this box and in the stigma where, again, people with the vouchers or people with Section 8 is lazy, but that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they just need a push to have a little bit more help. Yeah. And yeah. possibly with the counties or the state maybe having trainers like Lola said in a way, we had conversations also about possibly doing trainings for the landlords that are interested in transitional rapid rehousing or educating them on what it is and how it could benefit them, how it could benefit the youth, how it can benefit the county so we can all work together and everything can look better. And um, something else kind of popped up in my mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I know in Prince George's County, they just built a hospital, but they have an abandoned hospital near Landover. I'm like, I'm thinking they can use the abandoned places like that, the bigger places, kind of make it into either more transitional housings or at least another emergency shelter or a permanent supportive housing service with wraparound services instead of wasting the land and wasting the buildings. You can mm -hmm. kind of build upon that. That's yeah. all. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. Thank right. you. So appreciate it. Uh, Dan, I wanted to call you in. I know you're working. Can you talk a little bit about the area that you're working in and some of the things that have popped into your head as you've been listening to the conversation? Sure, yeah. As Emily was talking about um, landlord engagement from a system level, that's something that we've really been trying here in Maine. Um, so I work with veterans and um, we were making really good progress on the USICH benchmark sort of pre-pandemic. We had about 100 veterans that were experiencing homelessness in our state. On our by name lists, we had about 25 veterans that were falling into homelessness every month and we were housing about 23 of them. So we were doing pretty good on our inflow outflow and then sort of the pandemic hit. And I imagine like most people um, the housing market really just tightened right up. And what we saw is we started to see our inability to house people meant that veterans were staying homeless longer. Um, and our number of veterans um, who are experiencing homelessness ballooned from 100 to about 200. Um, so we sort of doubled in that time period. And we were thinking, you know, what are we going to do um, to really try to get back to where we were at pre-pandemic numbers. And we thought, um, we found the HUD strategy of a housing surge um, was something that we really wanted to implement. Um, so we created something called the 100 Veteran Challenge, um, where we were gonna house 100 veterans. Um, and through this process, one of the biggest things that we implemented was um, system level landlord engagement. Um, so we um, worked with our other veteran partners, a HUD bash, our GPD programs, anyone else kind of working with veterans in the state of Maine um, to uh, figure out how we could outreach landlords. Um, so a big part of what we did was um, a big media push um, with the story to kind of get thing, get the word out there. We had a web page that landlords could go to and learn more about the challenge and kind of get information and know how to contact people. Um, so that was that was really, really helpful. Um, 
but I think the thing that was most successful was um, our ability to sort of marry case conferencing with our landlord engagement. Mm -hmm. um, so what we would do is we would have meetings um, every day. Um, all veterans that were in our on our by name list, their caseworkers submitted sort of a, a pretty brief um, assessment, a, a housing needs assessment about where they wanted to live, what their income was, and the people that were doing the landlord outreach would have that access to that list and be able to um, see um, where in the state of Maine, because it's a pretty large geographic area that people are located, so we could focus our landlord outreach efforts there. And then as we had landlords agree um, in some circumstances to set units aside or say that they'd be willing to rent to our clients, we could go to the list, match veterans that fit the, um, the, that specific uh, landlord or that unit, um, and we had a process where we'd send the housing applications um, to the caseworkers. And we really found, and I think someone mentioned this before, speed is so important. So we would work really quickly to try to get a veteran in that unit. Um, and what we found like pre, um, before the surge, um, our system had really sort of, it, it was a struggle to house folks and we were housing about one veteran every two days. Um, during our 100 veteran challenge, we were almost housing a veteran per day. Um, so really what we're trying to do now is that our challenge is over. We're trying to take the lessons that we've learned and sort of continue implementing them. Um, but we really have found a lot of success. Um, we are, we're still meeting every week as, a, um, as a, a system to talk about landlord engagement and who's gonna contact who and, um, and sort of figuring out how to do that sort of effectively and efficiently. Mm -hmm. Dan, I really like what you said about how landlord engagement and case management should be in conversation with each other. I think that's true on a number of different levels because the landlord engagement folks need to know who we're housing, right? Because that's, what are the barriers that these households have so everybody can go back to their by name list. What's some of the biggest barriers you had? Bad credit scores, bad rent history, eviction history. Is it criminal background? You know, what are these barriers? And that's how you shape your incentives package. If you are able to do incentives by saying, we'll give you this signing bonus, but you're not going to do a credit history screening. We're going to give you, um, you know, uh, We'll give you a holding fee as we're uh, filling this unit, but you're not gonna charge an application fee. You're not gonna do um, a criminal background screen except for these certain things. I mean, you can really hone in. And I think one thing, again, in this 2.0 era of landlord engagement is we need to ask, we never give without getting anymore as a system. We need to pull ourselves up. We are not begging for units anymore. That's done. We are a business. We are offering guaranteed rent and we have things that we can offer as incentives, but you never give those away without getting something in return. And what you're trying to get is access to these units for the folks that we're serving. So see what your barriers are as a system and then use that in your incentive packets, package with what you're negotiating with. And I'll just say no one thing. I, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I want, get creative. I mean, we have certain incentives that are like go-tos now, but the sky's the limit. Someone on this call today could have the next great landlord incentive. One thing we came up for rural housing was we had a lot of units that did not pass HQS inspection. And even with rapid rehousing, we were using HQS inspection, not habitability standards, because if we wanted to put a voucher in for that household after rapid rehousing, or permanent supportive housing, we wanted it to pass HQS from the jump. So we had a ton of units in this rural community that wanted to work with us, but could not meet HQS. We paid for the repairs to be done prior to move in and in return for access to that unit for a certain number of years for that program that to meet HQS standards, which meant we had another unit online that could be used for multiple different rental subsidies not just one program, right? And that our community with quality of housing went up. So you can get creative based on what the needs are in your community and what you're running into. And I think rural and urban, it's all gonna be different based on your housing market, but get creative. That's where the fun part is with it. Mm -hmm. Did you make them go down on the rent if y'all paid for inspect? That's what, we gonna get it for a certain amount of years and come down on this rent because- yeah. We made your quality. We we own. We gonna we gonna take all of this out. We have all of the new stuff. Of, we gonna take it with us. 
we had a lot of landlords that were willing to come down on rent by a couple hundred dollars with a signing bonus because a signing bonus, this is not a deposit. This is a signing bonus, a check at signing of the lease. That's cash in hand, right? So that's more of a guarantee than rent in the future for this household. Mm -hmm. So they were fine taking, you know, $300 from us now and knocking off rent for a household. And that sometimes can bring it below FMR if you're on that line. And it can also be more affordable for the household. It all just depends on, you know, what you need and how you, but you always ask, um, always ask for something in return. Can I add, like, I love that, Emily, um, because I'm a big negotiator when it comes to landlords. I think like one of the things us as providers and as support systems for the participants that are in our program is that sometimes we think that we're dependent of landlords and we're not right like this is a give and take like the same way that you're giving us an apartment is the same way you're taking the rent and I think that sometimes you know when we go in as a selling point for the program and we go in with this like already mindset like I really need this apartment for this person that it really is in need we sometimes sell ourselves short and I think that it's important to know your value, know your program, right? Know what rapid rehousing is offering, know who your funder it, it, you know, is giving you and like how much you could stretch it. So when you're going with this landlords, you have the upper hand because at the end of the day, um, I've done my research before reaching out to landlords and I've noticed they have these units like three months without renting and I throw that out there like so you're going to have another five months without renting this unit because you're being picky for what because it's a youth sure. and you know they've never been in housing because of all these things that I'm here for and I think like sometimes sell yourself like hey this is why we're here for like this youth trusts us or this participant trusts us and this is that the resources that they could lean on right like another thing is that we never want to promise anything to a landlord when we're engaging like I know some some landlords like oh my god it's in a great community this is exactly what my youth or my participant wants but sometimes it's okay to hear no, right? It's okay to say no to a landlord because not every landlord is a good landlord, even if they have the greatest apartment. Sometimes we learn that landlord could be very ignorant, right? It could be a, a lack of education on both sides, whether that's rapid rehousing on itself or the population that we're serving. And they have this such stigma that they lean on and they feel like, well, I helped you. And I put this person that was in homelessness in housing. And I'm like, okay, so you want a medal for that? Like, you, you would have done that for anybody else, right? Like that you rent uh, units to students whose parents are paying their rent, like, you know, and, and we're guaranteeing you that this is happening. And at the end of the day, we need to make sure that these landlords are respecting the participants that we're putting on these units, aside from the part that their rent is being paid by whoever, right? And um, and that's a two-sided conversation, but I think landlords should know what they're getting themselves into and we should never sell ourselves short. And, and that takes a lot of preparation, right? Like that's having forms, that's having, I created like frequently asked questions by landlord and it's a form that I give them. I provide, if my, if my client has contribution, right? And we create an agreement, the landlord has that agreement. So they know, right? And when a landlord comes to me and say, oh, your client never paid their contribution. Okay, so when did you give this person in the anatomy have you reached out to this person this person it is their apartment it's their rent and, and the goal is that they are gonna be able to maintain it right and half of the time it's a miscommunication of something and the landlord is just putting more pressure where the pressure doesn't need to be because we've given them the power to do so and i think like we need to take some power away from them that was my experience to an extent um after the first year of the pandemic, I had some things that needed to be maintenance in my apartment. And even now I'll put in a maintenance request and it'll go by and by and by. And it was a list and I, I feel bad for the lady I'm calling. I'm like, I know I call every month and I give you five things and I've been giving you guys grace, but I need my shower fixed. I need my cabinet fixed. My ceiling light fell in my kitchen. And these are all real things that happen. And you guys are dragging your feet. And he's like, well, I can't get anyone. I said, okay, you have two days to get someone to call me. If not, I will be going down to housing. I will be contacting this person and your rent will cease. Like, don't, I, I'm, a, I'm a bargainer too. Like, once you know you have power and as a, a client or a youth, or I don't even know the terminology right now that I want to use for myself. I say, I have representatives. I'll call my lawyer. Like, and you will come, I'm going to see, see her on this email. You're trying to evict me, but there are things in my unit that hasn't been maintenance for six months. 
So how do you want to handle this? Like, do you want to lose guaranteed rent during a pandemic? Do you want to have a vacant unit? Or do you want to do your job? Like, which one is it? So when you take back power and you let people know that they can't bully you, like I have rights too. Like just because I'm paying with the voucher, you're still getting your money. And money is money because if I was in your predicament, I would just be doing, these are things that should be, that is a quality of life for anyone, whether you're paying with the voucher, whether I'm renting a unit, make sure that it's maintained. Make sure you're doing your job as a property manager, as a landlord, period. And once you tell them that and they know you can't be messed with, now when I call, they're like, hey, Miss James, yeah, we'll get right on it, you know. And I'm still reasonable. I'm like, okay, I'll give them a week. I'll give them some time. I'll give them this. I had a prop, a landlord, my landlord tell me like, oh, well, it won't get done until it's a discrepancy with the security deposit. I was like, I don't give a damn about that. That's not rent. You get rent every month. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about my shower being fixed. And take this, they charge me for plumbing, a plumbing issue. I have it on recording. The plumber saying it was an issue caused due, nothing due to me. I'm like, you need to take that off of my ledger. He's like, no. I said, take it off or I'll be contacting housing. That's not rent. That's not a security deposit. You're trying to charge me an extra fee for they redid my whole plumbing like it's like a thousand dollars why would you put that up why did you think that i was gonna be okay with paying that <laughs> so once you let them know like no you can't bully me into doing anything i will talk to a third party i will get a representative i will make sure that this is within my rights when youth and people feel like they have that that support then it, it doesn't let people be able to do anything because like you don't want nothing over here a, a, a couple of points that I just want to add on to, because I think it's important, is is particularly around incentives and and where you you where we don't want to go as a system, or I don't think we should go as a system. And that is, can is is pain to the point where you start pulling some landlords that haven't done anything for you in return, meaning that they haven't taken any of the folks with really poor credit and or. Um, some other issues that I'll mention in a second, but but really making sure that the incentive is smart incentive because throwing a ton of money at a landlord doesn't make a lot of sense either. What landlords care about is ongoing maintenance of that unit, meaning that the money is coming in every month. Because I'll give it to you like this. If I throw $2,500 at you for every single lease that you sign, believe you me as a landlord, as soon as a person didn't pay rent or missed rent for two months, even just their portion, you forgot about that 2,500. Because that went on like, especially mom and pops, that went on like, uh, <laughs> they paid their own bills. They went on a little va mini vacation to Las Vegas and lost it all on one bet on the table. They bet red instead of black or whatever, whatever the hell it is, that money's gone. And they forgot about that. So it's really important. to. It's great to have incentive, but be smart about how you're issuing those incentives that you're not, it's not repeat over and over and over again. Also, one of the points made earlier around centralized, loca uh, centralized location or centralized placement um, relative to working with landlords. One of the areas that we've noticed in LA a lot is that we'll have 15 different agencies applying 25 clients each to the same unit and they're getting 50 bucks a pop on the, on the background check. So really making sure that you're paying very, very close attention to that. These are all things that can be mitigated with either like longer term relationships with landlords and things. But I think the final point that I wanted to make was really around discriminatory practices and making sure that you're working with landlords that are actually inclusive instead of selective. And what I mean by selective is that you start tracking exactly who's being taken and who's not. Um, we, we started doing that with our landlords, looking at every single application that's gone in. And, and to, to Emily's point, we're no longer going to subsidize, and what I mean subsidize, pay for a, a, a landlord who is using discriminatory practices relative to the BIPOC community. It's not going to happen. So even if we were desperate and they had 500 units within their portfolio and they wouldn't uh, take the vast majority of people where they made remarks or they were watching people, to, Lo to Lola's point, charging people, watching people, reporting things that would they do that for any other regular tenant? No, we're going to stop using you because back to Emily's point again, you, we are doing you the favor 
the pandemic, I think it was a really great and, and is a really great way for us to build on that momentum, not forgetting that a lot of landlords have not been paid during this time because they took the chance on the regular renter and didn't want to work with us within programs because they've had a bad taste once or twice within um, the, the time working with us. And so and so now there, you know, some people have been waiting two years to get to get rent and they still, you know, in L.A., you can't even evict in L.A. for another year. And so for failure to pay rent. And so it's really, really important to build on the positives and where we can step in, be creative about the incentive and ensuring people are whole on the long term. So even if you're not doing things like looking at master leasing, you're not considering third party leasing, whatever that may be called, that, that you are building those incentives more on the back end. Because what you're trying to do is keep people housed the long term and not throw a ton of money at the front end. It might be good for a one-time fee at the front end, but saving those dollars to actually help maintain and keep landlord toll on the back end. So I think those are just some key, key things to remember, is, especially as you start to look for money. Oh, and the last thing is, uh, I see a lot of comments and they're like, how do you pay for this when it's HUD? How do you do this when it's like this one funding stream is remember leveraging the dollars, right? You've got to become master leveragers and creative with the funding that you do have and the different funding streams that you do have. Don't keep funding, you know, if you already have enough money or you're not fully utilizing this pot of money, then don't use your local pot of money to fund more of the same. Use your local pot of money that can be more creative to help leverage and fill in the gap. And so really finding the, the opportunities to fill in the gap so that you can provide all the different things to encourage more landlords to participate. I just want to piggyback on that, that I think this is another reason why you need to split the role of landlord engagement or landlord um, uh, intermediary and case manager, because when you blur that line as one person playing both roles, then inherently the case manager can't be the advocate for the client that they need to be with the landlord because they're also trying to preserve the landlord relationship they have that may, you know, 15 other clients may rely on that, right? So it gets really sticky and it can get interfere very much with trust with the clients and their case managers uh, by blurring those lines. So really separating out those roles keeps it very clear who's the advocate for whom in this situation and who is maintaining that relationship and, and what, what they're, you know, when, when an incident occurs, who is doing what. It can just be clarified when those roles are separated. And I think that that's really important for everyone that we serve so that they know who to depend on and who they can trust in these situations. Yeah, I just want to echo that, Emily. We we went back and forth so many different structures, and I just want to say 100%. Um, it's different skill sets, it's different incentives, it's different, and so um, I just would would echo that as being a really important thing. And then the other thing is to to be good at your word. I mean that that I think a lot of the techniques that landlords have been using is to sort of prevent problems. And so if you want to say you don't need to screen like you used to, you don't need to have a six eddy credit score, you don't need to have three times the, the um, income of, of rent in order to know that you're going to meet your business perspective, because we're going to be there to, to support you and the, and the tenant, you got to then really come through. And that's been really hard. I just want to say staff turnover you know, all, all the, the kind of challenges we have, but I really feel like we have to, we have to step up to our side of this so that landlords can feel confident, but separating the roles 100%, I think that's a really important piece. And also your wraparound, go ahead, go ahead, Lynn, go ahead. Go ahead. And, and the thing that landlord, whether you're multifamily or you own one, it's three things that we want. We want the, the resident to pay their rent, we want them to keep the apartment in the condition in which we gave them. And we don't want them to bother the neighbors because then that creates additional concerns that they have to manage. And when you have a lot of that wraparound at the beginning of the relationship, but then we're into a lease and there's not any of those services, then landlords have been told to just do them like you do everyone else. Well, they came in with all this support and now you want us to just use the tools that you know we would use. So I, I totally agree with Kathy. If, if we're in this partnership together, wrapped around whoever is, is going to be living there, that partnership has to go you know, all the way through. And then I'm just gonna throw this in too. I, I have a lot of organizations call me about housing, but in this industry right now, we've got jobs. 
And so I'll say, but you know what? I, we don't want to just house them. We would like for them to work, you know, whether they can do some leasing or they can do some maintenance work or work at a hotel or, you know, whatever. That The industry is hurting with that. And that resource seems like it's a total different entity from what this person works with. They're like, oh, I'll have someone else call you. And then we never get that person connected. So, you know, some people are just left with an apartment and it takes, it takes the income, it takes the employment, uh, you know? And so I, I think that's something to think about too, because that would get, especially the larger companies, maybe a little more interested because they do have apartments, but they also have jobs. <laughs> and um, all the jobs are not skill level. All of them are not in an office or outside. There's a mixture. And so I think that could be coupled up so that more work could be done. Thanks. I was just gonna say, um, Go ahead, yeah. really quick, um, the wraparound services that you provide. So I went to a conference. I don't even know what conference it was. It was in Annapolis. And someone said, a client asked them like, how do you know when milk is bad? And she was like, what do you mean? How do you know when milk is bad? And you don't know what you don't know. Like, so we have to remember that a lot of youth, a lot of people, it's about having the support. So if you provide the support on a program level, as far as, I don't, I hate like check-ins, like unit checks and stuff like that. But to me, I get it if I'm trying to make sure that this landlord wants to make sure that their unit is in good condition, because there are times where clients haven't had support and the unit has a hole in the wall. I know someone who children need support. Their mom has died and he he's trying to buy a house. But and this is someone who's a, a police officer that hasn't had experience with being homeless, but his family doesn't have the support they need. And his rental history is trash because his children can wreck a whole apartment in six months, which no landlord wants. Like realistically, I always play devil's advocate. I look at both sides. You always have to see it from the other's point of view. So what can I do to make sure that your concerns are addressed and that we're actually making sure these things don't happen? That's my thing. A lot of, of clients, they need the support. They need it after they graduate the program. They still need to check in. How are you doing? Because things change when you've experienced trauma. You can be doing good for three years. And then all of some, something triggers and now you're in the sunken place and it's bad. <laughs> so it's, it's the support and it's like uh, someone said, the relationship on both sides, who advocates for the landlord and who advocates for the client so that some way we, we, we meet in the middle and we have realistic expectations of both parties. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, Thanks, Lola. Uh, yeah. Um, I had a question for Laura. So, so should they have just like some um, transitional housing, like wrapper houses, have kind of like a set case manager or something to kind of make sure the residents that are there either on a voucher or a section eight is on the right path, like financially, mentally, because it can also be a mental thing. Also, where okay, you got the apartment paid for, and okay, you have the job there, but what if something, like you said, what if something happens where their mental is like... You're asking me? Yeah, like, do you think it should For be me, like case well, manager? Yeah, like yeah, there, I like... Think, right there? I think or, for me, what I've done, I've, I've kind of done it myself, not through programming, because I've graduated through programs, but I make sure I get my mental health services. I, I have a therapist. I didn't have therapy done the pandemic, but I got one now. I get PRP services. I have someone, cause it's easier to navigate the system when you have an advocate. Yeah. I feel like also you can't force anyone to do anything, but mm -hmm. these things should be offered. Like, yeah, like, like having like a liaison. We just need to be nicer to people. Yeah. Everyone has shit. Stop yeah. that, excuse me. <laughs> There's a word called Sonder which is S-O-N-D-E-R, which means everyone is living a life just as complex and complex and vast as your own. So mm -hmm. people who have a voucher are people, it's just, I think it's steps in life 
that some people, their steps were they had their parents to support them and show them how to do things and move into a home and then make their house a home and then become independent. Some people who didn't have those steps now have to be taught those steps in an unconventional way, which was me. I got a voucher. I got an apartment. And now I'm like, what the heck? I don't know. You move in and you're like, dang, you got to buy a toilet tissue roll holder. Like the apartment doesn't come with the holder to put the toilet tissue on. Okay. There's all these things and steps that you didn't know until you're experiencing it. Yeah. It's like, okay, you have to put a bill in your name. What do I do? You call them. You have, these are steps that people don't know. These are things that can make people reach a breaking point. But if you have the support, I'm lucky I ask questions. I've had mm-hmm. support in unconventional ways and I'm always asking questions. So I taught myself. Someone taught me, I know how to reach out for help. Some people don't know. But mm-hmm. if we can find a way to support those people in those areas that they need support in, it will be least likely that tumultuous things happen. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was all while everybody was speaking, I was also thinking kind of one of you thinking on the adult side, even the adult side, that there may be some, um, like along with the trainings for the landlords kind of knowing what transitional housing, rapid rehousing is in the programs, um, the youth and Yana Dawson, everybody have to know like their like rights, what goes into everything kind of before they get into the program and then during the program, I was thinking kind of along the ways of that. So whenever they do transition out or whenever something goes wrong that, they're prepared and mm-hmm. even if they're not prepared they know where to go yeah thank you thank you for that um i wanted to knowing we've got a little less than 20 minutes left i wanted there been this has been great thank you so much for your expertise i wanted to uh, pivot a little bit to some of our high density high cost markets and just talk a little bit about like how do you make this real right how do you make it real in new york how do you make this real in la how do you how do you transition some of this talk into markets that are the hardest to find units, uh, really low vacancy rates. Like what are some of the things, I know we've got experts in those communities on the call today. So like, what are, what are some of the things that you're thinking about in these markets or what has worked for you um, or your colleagues as you, as you expand and find uh, units in some of these markets? Do you wanna jump in and touch on that a little? I mean, who else, who's here from New York? Does Sly want to go? Sly, aren't you from New York? If you want to go first, you can go first. Right. I'll jump in after you. Okay, sounds good. I am, I mean, I think like we touched on it. I think Chris did a lot when it comes to like the share housing, right? Is using those strategies. But I think also trying, like I saw a question about FMR and like how we have this guidance of following fair market rent. And then when we go to our landlords, the rent, I mean, at least in New York City, is like double that, right? And especially, you know, when we try to match community to fair market rent to, you know, um, available resources around that community, right? And we, sometimes we're pushed to look to communities that are less resourceful, right? Because those are the ones that are have, uh, that are fitting those fair market rents. And I think a lot of the way that I go when it comes to housing search is a lot of negotiating that rent, like trying to figure out where is this fair market rent from the landlord standpoint, because we know fair market rent from what we're seeing. And then sometimes when we reach into our landlords, they increase that by like $200. And we're like, where is this coming from? Right. Um, and I think it, I come very prepared. Right. So I research my neighborhood and I know like, all right, if this is the, if, if, for example, we're using Zillow, which is one of the, the highest one. And I agree with Kathy, like sometimes you need to go outside the box and go on foot and like knock on these landlords. And if you see something, call that number. Um, but if you're using these kind of hype marketers, um, searching guides, right, that everybody's using, you should be expecting a pushback already, right? Because these landlords, their expectation for rent is very high. So going in there knowing like, well, the apart, like I've, I've, I've gone outside of even New York to house clients in Jersey, right? Because it's like cheaper and it's more economical, but even there, right? The word is getting around about rapid rehousing and what we offer. And they're like, no, we want this, right? And sometimes we need to come at them and say, well, um, the neighborhood that you're in is doesn't match that what you're trying to sell to us, right? And then what is the reasoning? And sometimes when you go and do these inspections, the apartment don't match what the rent is. And you're like, I'm paying $1,300 for this. Like, and it's a shoebox, right? So I think it's being very real and targeting um, 
the, those tough conversations with your landlord and being prepared to like throw it back at them. Like the house right next door is way cheaper than that in a speaker. And I've seen those situations where they're overpricing their apartments because they know it comes from a program and they know that the program is fully funded or whatever the case may be. But I'll let Chris share a few thoughts too. Um, so I, I always feel like I swear in LA right now, the, the only the only tone or tune that I'm seeing is the same one. I hate it because it's like repeat mode, but it's frustrating when our bureaucracy moves so damn slow and um, we can't get facilitate the changes that we need to. While in Los Angeles, we are our, our homeless population is growing, right? I, we're over 60,000 at this point and the vast majority of those being unsheltered. Uh, I guarantee you no community. I think the only other community that has as many people as us is New York, but with a right to, to, to shelter versus LA's, uh, we don't we don't have that we um, type thing. So anyway, I, I digress, but it's the thing that I've been seeing and, and, and I do a ton of consultant work around the country too. And so a lot of stuff relative to shared housing and the master leasing piece has just really become very relevant in the last two years, just understanding that we don't have enough studios and one bedrooms, except in the very, very, very um, um, expensive communities that are completely out of touch for our folks. So how do we do it? One, I think the most important thing is do not move somebody into a unit that you know at the end, they're never ever going to be able to afford if they're not gonna get a voucher and um, let's say they're on social security and they're not going to be able to work, moving them in, you're, you're setting them up for failure. Like don't do that. Uh, I think it's it's about really about yourself getting trained and your teams. If you're if you're in leadership, your team's getting trained on really understanding what your housing market is, because you know. In I know that we've all I'm I'm gonna guess this that we're all experiencing the same thing around staff shortages right now across the country and growth within our system, particularly with the infusion of ESG dollars and COVID relief funds that we've all kind of been given or hit with in the last couple of years. And so with the, with those dollars, we've seen this growth. And, um, you know, I, I have multiple positions that, that are open, but my point to that is I'm hiring a lot of green staff and they don't understand the housing market. They don't understand how to have the conversation with our participants. And so when, when somebody comes through the door and they're saying, well, I want to live here in this neighborhood, in this unit, they no one can talk to them about whether that's feasible, whether that's not feasible and the why behind it. We're not having, you know, one of the things that I think is really important is being transparent and honest when you're dealing with a participant and also when you're dealing with a landlord. You want both of them to be very well aware, not of every single circumstance with any particular client, but understanding the client nature as a whole when you're when you're trying to have that sales pitch to a new landlord, but also when you're having the sales pitch to a client, because I do think that the navigation work or the housing coordination work is sales. It's sales to the client. And then you have the housing locators that are sales to the landlord. And you have to know who your audience is and you have to understand all the different components of the market so that you can sell it and be able to explain it and have multiple different points. You can talk about gentrification. You could talk about the cost of housing. You could talk about why social security is going to limit their options or why GR, general relief, if you're in a state that offers some form of very basic general relief is going to limit the options and what are the components that need to take place and really not working a budget in terms of like the old school when you used to do a budget and ask people to save money because that's just like not real for any of you who haven't worked with a participant in a long time like i will remind you like that's not real so stop doing that but actually create budgets that are real working places to be able to have the conversation about what you're going to be able to afford that will start opening people's eyes i think relative to shared housing so here we go on the pitch again sorry those are sick of hearing it. But the reality is that for some folks, they're going to have to start in that space and they may end up in that space and that space isn't bad. And I always like to end this with like understanding that there's limited time left and want to give others a, an opportunity to speak, but really trying to give a, a little personal perspective. I, I come from privilege. I grew up in privilege. I left home at 15 when I was ready to get my life back together. This uh, 85 year old woman. So here's where the tra uh, transition age youth and like seniors like always play such a good part. This woman took me in and allowed me to stay with her and uh, and and went to college with me my very first day to school. Years later, I paid it forward and, and I ran into some person who was, I, I started creating a conversation, not in my workplace, but just in, in, um, in the community at large and had a conversation. He was a senior, 
he had lost his housing because he had had a heart condition, lost his job, blah, blah, blah. Years, uh, he moves in. I, I, I rent him a room very, very cheaply in my house, basically for free. Uh, he ended up living with me until he went into um, hospice care uh, 12 years later. He was there for the birth of my first two kids. He became a family. Here's my point to this, is that living with other people is a very natural thing for, for folks. And and But it's scary when we're talking about it from the perspective of persons experiencing homelessness first, because oftentimes people that have experienced homelessness have fallen into homelessness because of a bad relationship or a bad fallout or a, a situation they were in. Remember that 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 um, just because it didn't work once doesn't mean it won't work again. And the reality is, when you live in a really expensive market, you have choices to make about how you're going to be able to afford to live. And the thing is, is that you can start to penetrate new markets, even for people with lower incomes, if you start to share rent. And, and, and really making sure that as you're having the conversation, again, that you know your housing market to be able to sell it and to encourage people to consider different options. Don't force, remember choice. Choice also is about what unit and who they wanna live with and, and being really um, open and clear about that. I think transparency and knowing your market and being trained and being able to answer questions is gonna be key when you're talking to the participant. And here in the Washington DC, uh, Maryland, Virginia area, we do, we seem to have more ones and twos than we have the larger units. So we can't help as many people that would like a three bedroom. They're just very rare in this area, uh, in my portfolio anyway. And um, what we find is uh, it, it's full transparency because our pricing is all on the website. And we, you know, right now we don't switch a pricing uh, based on any type of program that someone's in. Um, and so you can see what our pricing is before you even contact us. And we also talk about managing expectations. I know you want to live here, uh, but is this somewhere you could live, still get to work, do what you need to do? Because here it's all about transportation, getting, you know, getting around. Is there a bus? Is there a metro? Um, and maybe this is a starting place for you. And, and then you can graduate. So we have a lot of conversation, a lot of different organizations. Um, trying to work this thing out here in the metropolitan area. And I think it's smart how um, some, some places are like, you know, show us the amount of move-ins that you've had this year and then, or this month and, you know, this quarter, and we can try to do our pricing from there. And it's not just a one size that fits all, fits all for the management company. Um, and that has helped us house a lot of different people with a lot of different programs uh, here in the area. I think one thing that I've seen working with several large cities in the southeastern area is we are also seeing our markets aren't real in a way because there's a lot of units being built that remain empty and they're being held by private equity and other investments and there's no breaks in our governments and our local governments to this so we have a lot of vacant units and we don't have enough units to rent to people who can actually live in the community and afford it. And I think this is the conversation that we are coming to as a country. And, and it's going to be local because housing is local. It will always be city county level, but our cities and counties earn money from the property taxes that these houses are on. And the more they go up in value, the more money our governments make. But what I don't think they're doing is balancing that out with the line items of the expenses and the costs of displacing and gentrifying and creating more um, homelessness in our communities. And they're not making that connection that you may go up over here, but you're really spending a lot of finances and you're costing the community over here. And until we have a very real conversation about that, we are all in a really tough situation. I just want everyone to know, like, this is really hard. We, we don't control the product we're trying to put people in. This is really hard work. We have pressure, we have money coming down on us, pressure to spend it. If we don't spend it, we're bad grantees, da, 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 da. But we don't have control over the units that we're trying to put people into. So that, that's why you're feeling this squeeze out there in the world. But I do think that's a very real conversation. And I think that this is the landscape where we could do a number of different things. I mean, Berlin, this, the city of Berlin just bought 15,000 units from property managers uh, who had monopolies in their city. And they're going to control those units now. What can we do in our, in our communities? It may not be 15,000 units. It may be more, maybe less, but could we do something similar to that? Like there are, there's just 
room for different possibilities in this conversation. And I think we're kind of reaching that tipping point at this point. Yeah, thank you so much, Emily. I wanna uh, make a slight pivot for our last five minutes. There've been a lot of questions around, this is all great, this is all great, I am one person and I'm one person operating our rapid rehousing program. I would love any kind of knowledge share of like, where do you start when your capacity, your staffing capacity is low, uh, when, you're, when you're beginning a program with one staff person? Um, what are some of the ways you think about uh, beginning this journey into rapid rehousing with, with not the amount of capacity that you would like to see to be able to do all these different roles? What are thoughts or reactions from you all? Grab some partner agencies that are running similar programs and create a team. Yeah, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan. Um, LA Family Housing, we, we happen to be the lead entity for our region of Los Angeles. And I constantly bring on small mom and pop um, advocacy groups. I'll bring in anyone into this work and help get them um, moving in the right direction to get funded because there are not, there are never enough of us. So especially the smaller folks, like you've got to leverage and connect with partners that can do this work and do and, and where you can do it together. Thanks, Chris. I also think you can never prepare for the list barrier, like always prepare. I think, you know, I'm like a form geek. Like I think sometimes words get twisted from one person to another, especially when you're trying to explain a program. So create tools for yourself that work and be able to change those tools as you go by and learn new um, new ways of engaging landlords or treating your staff. And always, always involve your participant into the process, right? Like if you're engaging a landlord, teach them how to engage it as well, right? Um, be mindful of language from, from participant to landlord and from landlord to landlord as well. I think that's a big one. And always educate your staff on everything in the program. Like I think that sometimes we try to hold back information with internally within ourselves. Like, oh yeah, no, that's case manager should not know about housing or whatever the case may be. And that should not be it. I think everybody should be training housing because at the end of the day, case manager just do take it over and it's a very hard thing to do if you don't know the language don't know the approach um but yeah um i can add in also along with the trainers and everything like that i think that like everybody was saying throughout this whole meeting that we have to find line lowers that are open-minded and aren't biased about who they're allowing in. I'm like, most people that are homeless or most people that are going through these things, especially during a pandemic, aren't criminals. They're not bad people. People go through hard times. You just have to be open-minded and um, see where things go sometimes. Sometimes have faith. And if, those, if the resources are lining up and the um, grants and stuff is lining up, with providing more housing and more services that I think it'll work out. This is stepping stool. Um, I was gonna say the same thing, even if you're not a, in a program, cause it's, it is all about linking up and creating a better community like Chris said, um, as far as going with another program who has experience in rapid rehousing and it's not a competition we don't have to compete it's enough funds out here some of them are competitive but it should be all about reaching the end goal which is serving your community but also even if you're not in a program this is i say this in every panel i'm on this is my motto this is what i live by your experience are not your experiences alone. Like you don't go through what you go through just for yourself. That's how I've gotten into this work. Um, I went to college. I did my first year in college. I did not see my life going like this. And then I became homeless after my first year in college. I've never gone back. It sucks. That was not my plan. I became homeless. I've gone through every type of housing program. And now I make sure that I do what I can do to make sure nobody has that experience. I do what I can do to make sure I can change the barriers I experience and make sure the next person who experiences it five years later has things I wish I would have had, or it's easier for them to gain access to the resources they need. Like you just have to be the change you want to see. I let people stay with me all the time because when I was homeless, I stayed with people. I slept on people's couches. I, community living is a thing. And 
when we isolate ourselves as a species, we some people like isolation, but it's really, I don't, it's not, some people, a lot of people don't thrive on their own. You always need someone to tell you to get back in the ring and keep going and you can do it when you're at your low points. So that's my thing. Do whatever you can in your community, even if it is, you know, allowing a youth to sleep on your couch or I've seen it on TikTok. It's a family who they feed college kids. They let them come and now they feed 600 college kids like three times a week. They cook for them. They've gotten, it's about community. Everyone needs support. We're very impressionable. We're, we have all different, have, we all have different types of experiences. So, oh, there's my dog. <laughs> I feel like that's such a fitting way to wrap this up. Thank you all so much. Uh, I feel blessed to have been with you. Uh, I wish we could all be in person together. I look forward to that. Uh, take care of yourselves. Um, be safe. Know that uh, this recording will get up on HUD Exchange sometime soon. Uh, we're going to do our best to get back and follow up with everybody that asks some questions. Thank you so much. Be well uh, and look for the next conversation on the Rapid Rehousing Roundtable happening next week. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, everybody. Be well. Bye.